Cool.fm is the perfect station for music lovers who enjoy a mix of adult pop, modern country, and classic hits. Our unique blend of different genres creates an awesome listening experience that you won't find anywhere else. With Cool.fm, you don't have to constantly change stations to hear the music you love. Just download the Live 365 app and start listening to our curated selection of modern adult and country hits, as well as the classics you know and love. So tune in to Cool.fm and start enjoying the best of all your favorite music in one place. Hey everyone, my name is Trevor Fernandes Lenkevich, the creator and writer of Area 51 The Helix Project and Minutes to Midnight, The Hour Between Life and Death. You can find me on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram, some way by typing in the words Pocket Watch Press, and you are watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined today on this amazing day with a very talented comic writer and creator. He is known for his Area 51 comic series, as well as a brand new series we're going to talk about today called Minutes to Midnight, but it's a little longer than that. We're joined by the ever-talented Trevor fernandez Linkovich. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, man. Just got off of a boats, trains, and planes episode of some type of sitcom, uh, but had a great time tabling at the Calgary Expo out west. Very happy to be here, man. Thank you for having me. Oh, good to have you on. We are talking about, of course, your Midnight's Midnight, and we'll touch on Area 51 as well, too, but we'll focus on Minutes Midnight this time around, which means you'll have to come back on and talk about Area 51 in the future as well, too. I'm getting ahead of myself. For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, Tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talk. My name is Trevor. I'm bringing an extensively long last name, uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm a, a young up and coming comic book writer, editor, art director, who is just kind of doing his best to bring something a little different to comics. My academic background is in molecular and cellular biology. So I'd like to think that I filter a lot of my more innate and natural creativity through the lens of a analytical thinker. So I kind of break things down into their constituent parts in order to build them back up again into a story. In regards to my career, uh, we just wrapped up my first ever comic book series, which was Area 51, The Helix Project. Now I'm bringing you guys Minutes to Midnight, which is a collection of short stories with artists from all around the world, incredibly different sort of subject matters and styles. So I'm very, very excited to be able to flex those creative muscles. Each story kind of is as long or short as it needs to be. Some stories are six pages. One of them is 22 pages. Another one of them is 18 pages. So I kind of wanted to give the stories what they needed in order to be the best they can. So what exactly is Minutes to Midnight about then? Because it sounds like you have multiple themes and arcs then for this uh, anthology. Absolutely. So in Minutes to Midnight, The Hour Between Life and Death is a collection of comic book short stories all written by me, but with uh, artistic pairings from all around the world, fine artists who play with watercolors and colored pencils to some familiar faces from the Helix Project, new letterers, new inkers, new colorists, new artists. There is some familiarity there. Ultimately, I really wanted early on in my career to keep myself from getting pigeonholed. I feel really great about what we did with the Helix Project, and I'm so proud of what we were able to accomplish. But I think sometimes creatives tend to get put in a box. I wanted right out the gate to say no actually I'm competent enough to play in whatever space uh, I deem necessary. I wanted to come up with a plan to do a collection of short stories that is somewhat in keeping with my little independent publishing operation, Pocket Watch Press. And so I thought, what better time to start than at midnight, the beginning of a new day, the end of the old day. And thematically, the idea came to me just thinking about perspective. When you reach that sort of late night hour, it's either clarity or bust, right? You're either sitting in silence, working through the emotional strife of days past, or you're digging yourself into a new hole. And so I wanted to sort of explore the idea of perspective through these different angles, through these different genres, through these different characters with different challenges and outlooks. And I wanted to keep it vague enough to where I really could kind of stretch myself and stretch the artistic teams that I have the privilege of working with. You touched on that there from all over the world. Was there some creative people that let's gather the people I've heard about or worked with and see how they come together in this type of new sandbox? 
I mean, it was kind of a bit of both. You know, I definitely wanted to reteam with the guys from the Helix Project. I think by the end, we really, really clicked. We ended up making something that rivals anything else on the stands. I would be foolish to not want to work with them again. We are in an entirely different context. Aside from that, it's funny, these stories were all sort of percolating to some degree or another while I was writing the Helix Project. And I had a rough idea of what I wanted to do with them stylistically, and some of them changed drastically as I went through them and wrote them. And other times it would come down to me scrolling through the internet and thinking to myself, oh, wait a minute, actually, I might want to bring it in this direction. And fortunately, <laughs> I, I, I lucked out and we now have a handful of artists who uh, were interested in the premises for their stories and decided to jump on into it. I, I couldn't be more happy with how it turned out. We are, of course, reteaming with Samuel Ibunze, who picked up on the last two issues of the Helix Project, except this time he's actually coloring his own artwork as well for the premiere story in Minutes to Midnight. It's called Reflections and Other Little Devils. It is a uh, paranoia-induced detective thriller about Carlos Mancebo, who is an aging detective as he investigates the string of suicides linked to addresses from a stretch of properties that were involved in an eminent domain seizure attempt. However, it failed. His discoveries and drug-laden flashbacks lead him into the gullet of a saw-like murder case. It actually ends up putting his long-dead marriage into question and his story kind of spirals out into this sharp edge story of perception control addiction vastly different from what sam and i did on the helix project but very stoked moving further we have the bear market businessman a sort of sci-fi future drama it moreover uses the setting of sci-fi than other tools because i feel like this idea of an industrialist future kind of plays into this really small character drama uh, in a great way ryan is is coloring his own work there as well which is very different from me i i the privilege of meeting him last year in Charlotte uh, for Heroes Con. I had gotten a beautiful commission by him. And what really struck me was his expressive line work and his ability to make these characters feel emotionally lifelike, although his art style isn't necessarily realistic. And I'm actually uh, going to be lettering that story. So that's really, really exciting. And let's see, we have Time Fleeting War Immortal, for which uh, I have not announced the artist yet, but I will be very excited to do so in the next couple weeks. Uh, right before launch, it's a little bit of a larger name and we kind of wanted to make it a little bit more explosive. Time Fleeing War Immortal is a story that I'm immensely proud of, and that story really grew and changed as I started writing it. It began as something that was a little bit more of a satire, and morphed, it certainly is still a satire, but it kind of morphed into something that's a little bit more of like a Dante Alighieri mm. uh, comedy. There are very, very tragic elements as well. It is effectively a historical fantasy about two nearly immortal soldiers who reconvene throughout every great battle in human history to settle a conflict that spans from the beginning of time before it was ever recorded to the end of time. It's effectively me kind of exploring the changing landscape of war and conflict, conditioned adversity, and of course, the very, very human theme that we will never quite have enough time. I'm very, very excited to bring that out into the world. And then beyond that, we also have the marvelous misadventures of the melancholy man with the incredibly talented Steph C, who is a, a Mexican artist. I mean, stylistically, she's just so different from everybody I've ever worked with. She uses these apps absolutely stunning color palettes where she's layering more earth tones in colored pencil under watercolor. Her art style is super expressive, very sort of reminiscent of Pixar animation. She brings a lot of emotionality to the story. Marvelous Misadventures of the Melancholy Man is ultimately a supernatural coming of age story about an empathetic boy who turns others into gold. He's named Midas after a character in King Lear, but we, we kind of take a little bit more of a twist on that as he has to learn to find balance in a life where where a simple touch could mean healing someone else's mind at the cost of his own. This first story, this is the only story that will be syndicated throughout every upcoming collection that I do. This first story finds him entangled in a childhood conflict that forces him to face down the moral pendulum and leads him to making a familiar acquaintance to any longtime comic book fans. There's a little bit of a tease there for you. It's a very powerful story, and while this first one comes off a little bit more innocent, in the future, I think the thing I look forward to most is exploring how this very bright, 
poppy emotive style is going to play juxtaposed against more and more adult themes as this character comes of age and has to begin to cope with that emotional volatility granted by his innate abilities working with incredibly talented people that i think are bringing the best out of me which is, is super exciting i've gotten to learn a lot about different approaches not only to the process how to collaborate with different people and it's been incredibly exciting there's a lot to, to unpack with all that too especially being new to the comic scene and new to comic writing for this type of medium obviously you've learned a lot about yourself from a creative perspective but have you learned a lot about yourself from a moralistic or maybe internal perspective yeah, that's a great question. I absolutely think that that's the case. When you write stories that matter to you, ultimately, it's like free therapy. At least that's what you're trying to get out of it. I don't know if it works for everybody or for every story. So sort of new <laughs> that I can't really say that it happens all the time or every time. When I write stories, they're ultimately trying to work through or attack something from an angle that I don't quite understand. And sometimes there are things that really push me on an intimate and personal level. And sometimes they're sort of larger, more philosophical questions. And and I, I kind of work through those things with these characters and use the landscapes of the worlds that they exist in to challenge them. So definitely, I'm emotionally connected to all of these stories in very different ways, almost exploring them through these sort of hypotheticals. And realistically, the story is the hypothetical. And sometimes I walk out of them feeling different than I did when I walked into them. And other times they sort of reinforce maybe a bias I might have already had. But ultimately, this is the most cathartic form of free therapy I think possible. And all I have to do is pay artists to draw it <laughs> yeah blood sweat tears money <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> sacrifices to the gods that and you don't have to lay down on a, lay down on a couch and talk to a person that isn't just in your headspace right? that's true it would be lovely if insurance would cover some of these costs well uh, stick to comics it's cheap <laughs> Well, what do they say? Become a comic writer and you'll never have enough money to do anything in your life. Something like that. <laughs> I've never heard that. I kind of like it. I'll be putting that on a t-shirt fairly soon. Yeah, Looking at your, at your creative journey and creative process here, uh, everyone goes back to, and, and I can see it behind you as well too. You have a lot of amazing mediums uh, with Batman and DC. So. Oh yeah. I mean, I have books everywhere, but yeah, there's a, that top shelf is all Batman. I got a bunch of uh, indie on the... The middle two shelves, Marvel on the bottom. What got you into reading comics then? Oh boy. Um, I, you know, I wasn't like most people. I didn't start when I was younger and then give up on it because I discovered uh, other things and then come back to them. I was 16, 17. I had gotten stuck at a friend's house uh, during a power outage. And so we had kind of unboxed some comics, man. And I realized that uh, maybe comics weren't uh, as juvenile as other things or other sort of social standards would have had me believe and it led me down a deep wikipedia rabbit hole when i got home and eventually i made the daring decision to buy all seven issues of final crisis mm -hmm. for whatever reason <laughs> and so that was like the first story i ever read and i remember walking out of that obviously being like absolutely enthralled by the jg jones art but i was like why just all these whys and i saw grant morrison's name on batman and i grew up with batman the animated series batman beyond i it, i mean that that's my guy it led me to picking up his batman run i ran through it and once i finally wrapped up i went into the comic book store for the first time as a comic book reader and was like what's next <laughs> and somebody pointed me toward the new 52 Batman. It was uh, Scott Snyder and Greg Bulo, Jonathan Glappian's Court of Owls. Man, I, I ran through that first volume, went back within like two days, bought the next one. And then I was met with the unfortunate news that you could not buy trade paperbacks so soon after the volume comes out. In fact, they released the hardcover and I was 17. I did not have a job. And... <laughs> That $8 that I had to pay at a Barnes & Noble to get the hardcover of Death of the Family really stung, but I was addicted at that point. And eventually, uh, I realized that I would have to wait six months for even the next hardcover to come out. So I became a Wednesday warrior and reading Batman led into reading Batman Detective and Justice League and then The Flash and Green Lantern eventually marvel and then i really wised up and started reading indie however many years later here i am trying to spill my own thoughts out onto the comic book page everyone usually asks what's the wisest piece of advice or what's the most bs piece of advice that you've ever received but what is the second wisest piece of advice that you've received that has stuck with you in your career Good question. You know, I, I'll say this. I got a piece of advice by a creator that I deeply admire this past summer. 
And it was about retaining a certain level of ego because comics are tough. Uh, and no matter how good you are, you will constantly be faced up against people and, and institutions uh, or inclinations that tell you otherwise. You know, this person kind of instilled in me that if you believe in what you're doing, you believe in the story that you are telling, that you should know it and you, you shouldn't have to shy away from it. Uh, obviously it's good to be humble. It's good to know that and be aware and show that other people are contributing to it. But I've definitely found that piece of advice, I think really helped me hit my stride uh, creatively. And as an independent creator who is trying to get their work out into the world, because certainly you are faced with a lot of rejection, a lot of people ignoring you. And I can't help but feel like if I had gone through the last couple months without that advice, I think I'd be in a very, very different place. Yeah. I'm now I'm curious, what is the worst piece of advice you've gotten? It's more over like a, a generalization. The young guys kind of have to pay their dues. Mm -hmm. I think for a lack of better terms, it's it's kind of BS. I think the idea that you have to pay your dues simply because somebody's been around longer than you does not cater to the idea that the best work wins. And I understand it's subjective. At the same time, I'm a big believer in learning your craft, executing your craft, and growing that ability to execute. I think the idea, the pay your dues mentality enables the people at the top to grow stagnant and rest on their laurels and get the work that maybe they don't deserve, right? It doesn't just speak to me and, and my ambitions, I can think of half a dozen really young hunger creators that deserve opportunities that they're not getting because of people who are not hungry anymore and are deciding to show it very obviously. And so the worst general piece of advice is, is that kid, you got to pay your dues. I don't believe in that. I think my obligation is to tell the best stories I possibly can, be the best collaborator to the artists that I work with, and ultimately create something that we are all proud of and something that we would all read if we weren't creating it. Well, that's the good news about today's world and society is that independent creators like yourself can put together a crowdfunding campaign, can get together a book, can pay their to put together an amazing book that people can purchase and can support. It's not like you have to go to a publisher and actively do that. If you can, great. But if you're doing it yourself, like many independent creators who have been on the show in the past have done. Do it yourself and the, that's the best thing you can do. It's what we're trying for, you know, and I think that avenue speaks to the future of the industry. I think the direct market in some form will always exist, mm -hmm. but the idea that creators are now just as capable to put their work out in the world and to express their thoughts and their ideas through their medium of choice is pretty incredible. Now, it certainly presents its own new field of challenges and it retains some classic challenges to the direct market. But the opportunity to build an audience to surround you as a creative voice is pretty incredible. In the direct market, ultimately, when it comes to a big two comics, the conversation becomes around the characters. And characters are ultimately the things that we are trying to build and become the most proficient at executing on, I think, above all else, because great characters build great stories. You know, in a world where the writer does not move the needle as much, or the artist does not move the needle as much of, as the character... This gives us the outlet to make sure that it's about the writer, it's about the artist, it's about the people who are creating the book, because now we're building an audience of people who trust our vision as opposed to trusting a brand as a form of identity. The good news is you're creating your own brand with your own products though too. So win-win in that case. I'm doing my best. <laughs> So then what was an early experience where you learned that language had power? Man, it's weird. I get frustrated, right? It, because you run into a lot of people that don't quite understand that language has power. And so I think my awareness of that became privy to people telling me things that they didn't mean because they didn't understand the implication of their language. And it made me upset or frustrated or disappointed. And so there was an element for me growing up where I really wanted to make sure that my thoughts, my feelings were communicated clearly. You can't really do that unless you're aware of the tools afforded to you, right? That's our verbal technology language. So I would say that wanting to make sure that I didn't disappoint or misconstrue my thoughts or feelings to anybody else. As a kid, you get disappointed. People tell you things or a young person, I, uh, yeah, you know, it's a bummer when someone goes, oh no, I actually, I meant this. It's like, well, why didn't you say it the first time? You know, that in and of itself is quite frustrating. So as I got older, I just wanted to make sure that 
I was doing the best I could to articulate what I wanted and what I was feeling so that nobody ever, you know, could misconstrue that, whether it be to preserve their own personal feelings or the way that people might try to parrot segments of what you say. You just make sure that you communicate clearly and it saves you a lot of trouble. What is your best advice for writers that are starting out in today's comic scene? Take every opportunity as an opportunity to learn, especially when it comes to reading or consuming media. I think it's always important to take a couple minutes at the end and think about what worked well for you, why it worked, what didn't work well for you, why it didn't work. Whether you're reading a comic, reading a novel, watching a film or television, it informs your intuition as a storyteller. And it also informs more of your sort of conscious thinking and the way that you approach it because some things stick with you. And so I think you know, more often than not, when people pleasure read, they kind of turn off their brains. And I think it's important to keep them on as best as you can so that you can begin to acquire tools, put them in your belt so that you can play with them later. What's your creative prep tonight? I have made the mistake and I still make the mistake now and again, actually more often than not, to be too precious with my writing time. Early on, I think partly because I kind of found writing a little bit later than most people would. I used to feel like I had to set myself up in order to write. I had to have a coffee with me and I had to have like sat down and read for 25, 30 minutes and just gotten the juices flowing. And the reality is when you are a creative, you got to take whatever time you can get to create. And it's almost never going to be ideal. It's almost never going to line up. Apropos of my trip home from Calgary, you know, there were some times where I had to pull out my laptop. I'm kind of a bigger guy. So I had to pull out my laptop and squeeze in some words here and there on my script writing software. And there have been several times where I've had to hole up in the airport bar just to squeeze whatever Wi-Fi I can to send art notes out to an artist or get a file somewhere or receive a file. You got to do it when you can do it. Don't be too precious about it. If the stars align so that you can have this like bubble bath-esque experience, then so be it. But don't expect it. Don't rely on it. Create. Go out there and do it. Bubble bath esque life. I like that. That's, that's good. <laughs> Better put that into one of your comics uh, ahead of time. Maybe uh, in air, Area Fifty One, there put a bubble bath esque comic writer as a teacher. They they steal from like a store or something. It'll happen eventually. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? Oh man, that's a loaded question. So it's kind of twofold in terms of industry people. Brian Hill was a huge inspiration of mine. Before I was writing comics, I was reviewing comics and interviewing creators in college because I had no friends that wanted to talk about comics. Brian, you know, he's a busy guy. He, he does a lot of work for comics and for film and for television. He would always kind of iron out a little bit of time to either talk to me for an interview and, you know, correspond here and there. And he was always incredibly encouraging of taking that leap of being fulfilled. I went to university for molecular and cellular biology and that sort of threshold of time where I thought about taking this leap, but I was petrified to death. I felt like I was making an awful decision that I would regret for the rest of my life. At the time, I didn't realize that not making the decision is the thing that I would have regretted. And because of his wisdom, because of his sort of soft-spoken nature, you know, Brian was able to kind of get that through to me and ultimately was a huge reason as to why I started writing comics and taking it seriously. Uh, I'm just very grateful to him for taking the time and the energy. Another one is, you know, my mom. You know, I grew up with a single mom. She always worked hard, always wanted the best for me. And during that same threshold of time, I was petrified to tell my mom, who worked so hard to raise me by herself, that I did not want to become a research doctor anymore, that I wanted to become a writer. She was so accepting uh, because she had enough trust in me to know that if I were to make this decision, that I had thought it through. And that whatever was waiting for me on the other side would, would be something of my own making. To that end, she had faith that I would make something for myself. I was really grateful for that love and that kindness and that understanding because I've run into a lot of people whose parents just tried to talk them out of it every step of the way, well into their career. And I never had that. Incredibly grateful. She saw it in me. She saw I was absolutely miserable. I was good at it, but I hated it. And for a long time, I didn't know that I hated it. And there was a moment when I was doing the press stuff where I had went to a Marvel panel and asked a question about reconciling creative purity and intention with larger corporate interests. And like C.B. Cebulski had basically had asked me to apply for a job. And that moment changed my life because I, first of all, you're getting courted by one of the sort of 
people in charge of the largest publisher in the industry, one of the most sort of lauded. But there was also, you know, the time when, when COVID came and lockdown happened and that got pulled out from under me. And I was just like, I don't want anything else. Like, I didn't realize how close I was to having a life that I never knew I wanted. I just couldn't be more grateful because I can't help but feel like if if my mother, you know, who is who is my number one person in the world was resistant, that could have changed everything for me because it was such a time of instability between questioning my future, questioning the world, the future of the world, right? During the early days of the p pandemic. And so that was super pivotal. And I don't really get to shout her out enough for being such a reliable safety net. In, in that way, emotionally and mentally. From a professional standpoint, you have created multiple issues of Area 51. You're putting together Minutes to Midnight, as well as I'm sure many projects in the future that you'll have to come back on and talk about in the future. So we can Absolutely. touch on your amazing creative journey that you are going on now. From a professional standpoint, you're successful in that regard. Do you consider yourself personally successful? Oh boy. <laughs> yes, with a caveat. I'm confident enough and proud enough of the work that I've put in and the work of my collaborators and ultimately what we've been, been able to create so far as a, a product that is greater than the sum of its parts and that has grown along with us. But I am always a proponent of staying hungry, always looking at the last thing you did as the worst thing you will have done moving forward. I, I always sort of joke when I'm at conventions and I'm selling people on my book especially if they've read like the first issue, first three issues is I'm really glad you liked it. I'm really glad you came back because those are the worst things I've ever written because I think sometimes people take moderate or even modest levels of success. They get too comfortable. It cuts into their drive. And for me, I always want to be working to better the craft and to become a greater storyteller. I set these almost unrealistic goals for myself um, really with the intention of never truly being satisfied because I haven't hit those goals. So, you know, until everybody definitively says that I'm better than Alan Moore, uh, then I will keep hungry and I will keep striving to be better and better and better. AKA, I will keep striving until the day I die because that probably will not happen. But to answer your question, I think on some small levels, yes, uh, I'm very proud of what I've been able to do, but that modest level of success does not keep me from wanting to achieve more and more. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? I reflect, I pivot because failure is not death if you don't want it to be. And I think there are also certain degrees of tempered failure that you have to allow to happen. The question is, is whether or not the, the blade of failure is uh, sharp and you can control that. I think it's really important to take certain calculated risks in trying to get your stuff out there. But you should always be learning from them and, and learning from the failures that you don't see coming because they can turn you into something far greater than uh, what you would have been without it. Art ultimately also kind of is a product of struggle. And so I think this idea of making things too easy, making things too smooth, feeling opposed to that adversity kind of goes against everything we do as creative people and probably as human beings, right? Because we are problem solvers. How do I deal with failure? Ultimately, I look it in the eye, figure out what it's all about so that I don't have to confront that particular brand of failure ever again. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as a writer or a creative person in some way, shape or form, maybe they've looked upon what you've created and what you'll continue to create and you've inspired them as others have inspired you. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? Who, uh, being open and being honest and being aware, I think is really important. Uh, when I think about the creators that approach me at tables asking for advice uh, or on the internet or what have you, a lot of it is just about being open and being willing to share uh, my experiences, but also being honest in the sense that like, I don't want to run away from my failures as a creative person or as a human being. And so I try to be open about that. And I also try to be open about the topics that 
I don't feel as equipped to answer. I will try to provide clarity as I can for whatever I have to offer. I think it's important that if, if I don't feel comfortable giving advice on a certain topic, just to say, hey, this is something that I'm unsure of. This is how I might feel about it now, but it's also liable to change upon new experiences. Staying humble and remembering where you came from. I've always been a big proponent of sharing my growing comprehension of the craft. In books, I often will put sort of behind the scenes director's commentaries and process stuff. I do it in my newsletter all the time, just because I remember a couple years ago when I was just getting started and I felt like there was just no material out there for the creator, especially not quite articulate material talking about the craft and the tools available to you and how you can use those tools to convey your intentions as a storyteller. I always, always try to share that with people as best as I can, as honestly as I can, and as openly as I can. If your life was a comic book, what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be? Oh boy. <laughs> uh, man, uh, the title? Man, I'm trying to like process both of these things. Like, Because I feel like almost any answer you give can either come off as like way overconfident or too self-deprecating. And there's like no in between. One of my short stories kind of already has oh. a, a perfect title <laughs> for my life. And it's the... Marvelous Misadventures of the Melancholy Man. <laughs> that definitely kind of wraps it up quite nicely. In terms of soundtrack, oh boy. Probably be like a medley of James Brown or something. <laughs> it's like he's high key talking about some very personal struggles with life and depression of women, but it sounds so good all the time. And most of the time it's exciting and it's energetic. And ultimately I feel like that's what I try to do with comics, right? Like I take personal things, whether they're optimistic or things that I struggle with. And I try to turn them into what would be my equivalent of a song and in writing a story and doing it through comics. I feel like that is actually a pretty good answer to that question for me. We all have to have a little James Brown in our life sometime, you know? <laughs> yeah, dude. I, man, I, I love James Brown. I love James Brown. I've actually, I have to rotate my alarms because I'll get so used to them that I'll sleep <laughs> through them. But there have been probably two or three times where I've had a James Brown track. I've had like get up off of that thing was one for a long time. Well, Trevor, I do hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Hey, man, it, it, it was great to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you for asking such insightful questions uh, and for making me think <laughs> in, in ways that I don't often get to, man. Um, it's You do this a lot or you do this often enough and you get asked a lot of the same questions, rightfully so, right? People want to get the basics down. So it's always refreshing um, when people ask you the questions that give you a little bit of pause. Uh, so hopefully I will have those down in my arsenal and be able to look a little bit more prepared the next time you come at me with some crazy questions. <laughs> Before I let you go, where can we find you? How can we support you? Of course, where is the Kickstarter campaign? Anything else you'd like to promote? So you can find me on Instagram and on Facebook at Pocket Watch Press, on Twitter at P Watch Press. Shout out character limits. My work, Minutes to Midnight, The Hour Between Life and Death, will be hitting Kickstarter in the face on May 22nd, 2023. And I'm super excited to bring that to you guys. The links are going to be all over my social media, inside the bio, in pinned posts and or tweets. So make sure you guys go give that a look. It is the best thing I've ever made. And while I understand my career is relatively short, there's so much of my personal and creative education um, that shines through in those stories. I've grown so much over the last two years telling stories for you in the form of comics, and that is on full display in these stories. I'm more than happy to show off the incredible collaborators that I have working on them. So I hope you guys will give it a look. We do our best to deliver value. Keep it in mind, launching May 22nd, likely ending around that same date in June, consider backing. Kurt, thank you so much for having me, man. Thank you for, for giving me a, a platform to talk about the things that I care about most and for doing that for hundreds, if not at this point, thousands of other people like me. Your work is deeply appreciated. I appreciate it. It's over 1,200 at this point, but I've literally lost count in 15 years. Eventually, I'll figure out what the actual number is. But for now, I just, I like having people like yourself that are so talented and creative and are finding their passion in, in what they're enjoying doing, whether it's early or late in their, their lifetime. So keep up the amazing work and come back on anytime. Oh, cheers, man. Thank you so much.
Like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others quite literally on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's the word, you not the number two. Website's going through a revamp. So go to our YouTube channel, which is a lot more updated because I'm only one person. It's youtube.com forward slash TGT Media. The podcast is back after 12 or so years, finally, which is twogeekstalking.podbean.com or just search for Two Geeks Talking on iTunes, Spotify, or your favorite audio streaming service that you get your podcasts on. And as I say every week for the last 15 years, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.